Resting in the Johnson Space Center parking area lies a colossal 363-foot Saturn V launch vehicle, the mightiest apparatus ever constructed by our species, collecting grime rather than venturing into deep space. Meet SA-515. A complete perimeter walk around its foundation requires a full five minutes to traverse just the initial segment. Crane your neck toward its summit and witness an object exceeding the height of three dozen stacked floors. This behemoth was destined to transport Apollo 18 toward our lunar neighbor. Astronauts had been designated. The touchdown location had been determined. Scientific instruments were constructed and prepared for deployment. Launch day never arrived. Yet the explanation doesn't involve extraterrestrial beings or shadowy governmental plots. It represents something decidedly more earthbound and profoundly more heartbreaking. What follows explains how our species' most remarkable voyage beyond Earth, operating at the absolute zenith of its technical prowess, faced intentional destruction and abandonment. The reason wasn't inability to venture onward, but a conscious decision to halt progress. Conventional accounts describe mere financial restrictions, the unavoidable conclusion of an expensive undertaking. Yet classified documents expose something more sinister. The calculated termination of humanity's finest exploratory endeavor precisely when it achieved maximum scientific effectiveness. This recounts a phantom expedition and the price we paid by forsaking it. Transport yourself to 1970, positioned inside the Vehicle Assembly Building at Kennedy Space Center. You're an engineering professional who dedicated the previous 10 years perfecting the most advanced exploratory apparatus ever conceived. Surrounding you, work crews assemble spacecraft representing the apex of accumulated knowledge. Each setback studied, each component enhanced, each insight from previous expeditions incorporated into the machinery. This represents Apollo's intended culmination. By 1970's arrival, NASA had evolved lunar expeditions from risky ventures into polished scientific endeavors. Initial Apollo flights emphasized mere survival. Reach the destination, display the banner, return breathing. Apollo 18 was conceived as something significantly grander. A J-class expedition representing Lunar Exploration Technology Summit. Consider the distinction between a vacationer capturing snapshots at the Grand Canyon versus a scientist dedicating seven days charting its most profound mysteries. Statistics reveal the transformation. Apollo 18 planned three to four days inhabiting the lunar terrain, not Apollo 11's short, cautious intervals, but sufficient duration to create an authentic research station. The team would execute three distinct EVAs, accumulating 22 to 24 exploration hours. They'd install the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, ALSEP, a complex instrument array engineered to reveal the moon's most guarded information regarding interior composition and atmospheric conditions. Tremor detectors for identifying moonquakes, thermal probes for gauging internal heat levels, field sensors for charting magnetic properties. These transcended mere tools. They embodied inquiries we posed to existence. Additionally, they'd operate the lunar rover an electrically powered transport capable of venturing 12 kilometers from touchdown coordinates, converting the expedition's scope from a confined zone surrounding the lander into legitimate exploration. Picture the contrast between confinement to your yard versus possessing transportation enabling countywide investigation. That represented the rover's significance for lunar research. Candidate locations being evaluated, Copernicus Crater, Schroeder's Valley, featuring its characteristic Cobra Head Volcanic Formation, or Gassendi Crater, represented scientifically valuable landscapes previous expeditions hadn't accessed. These weren't merely attractive destinations. Copernicus was a comparatively recent impact formation potentially exposing materials beneath the moon's exterior layer. Schroeder's Valley was an enormous channel possibly containing evidence of prehistoric volcanic processes. Gassendi occupied the Mare Imbrium boundary, where highland and mare formations intersected. Each location was a repository of lunar chronicles awaiting examination. The Saturn V vehicle, assigned to this expedition, SA-515, embodied engineering excellence's pinnacle. Position yourself beside one of its five F-1 power plants. 
and you're observing a flared exhaust cone 12 feet in diameter, a mechanical blossom capable of generating 1.5 million pounds of force. Combined, all five engines could deliver 7.65 million pounds of thrust, adequate power to propel 310,000 pounds completely to the moon. That equals 40 elephants' mass accelerated to 25,000 miles per hour, then projected across a quarter million miles of emptiness. What amplifies this achievement's magnitude? Launching a Saturn V demanded identical massive resources and national organization as conducting a Super Bowl. Thousands of staff functioning in flawless coordination. Months of preparation for one occurrence. Complete exactness, mandatory at every tier. The distinction? One occasion would captivate the planet for an afternoon. The alternative would enhance human understanding for successive generations. Yet there's something requiring comprehension about reaching this achievement. At Grumman and North American Rockwell facilities, engineers had recently commemorated finishing Lunar Module 13 and Command and Service Module 115, the final specimens of their category. These weren't experimental prototypes accumulating grime in storage facilities. They were flight-certified vehicles fueled by dedication and skill of thousands of laborers who trusted their workmanship would attain the moon. Every connection was flawless. Every pathway was verified. Every mechanism had been enhanced through insights gained from preceding expeditions. NASA had ultimately resolved the initial difficulties. The expeditions were more secure than previously. The research was more advanced than anyone had envisioned feasible back in 1961 when Kennedy delivered his commitment. Apollo 18 embodied the instance when we'd evolved from frantic trailblazers into assured explorers, when the moon was no longer a target, but a research facility. This was humanity at its peak, constructing apparatus that challenged physics, posing inquiries that extended beyond ourselves, advancing forward not because it was simple, but because it was challenging. Yet while engineers refined their apparatus, a separate countdown had commenced, one destined to demolish the program internally. The year was 1970, and America was hemorrhaging funds. Vietnam was devouring $2 billion monthly, not annually, monthly. That's $67 million daily, disappearing into Southeast Asian jungles. Urban centers were erupting, the civil rights movement had revealed profound injuries in American civilization, demanding immediate focus and resources. And NASA was requesting Congress to authorize three additional moon expeditions, each requiring between $350 and $450 million in 1972 to gather additional specimens. Calculate the figures. One Apollo expedition required what you could utilize to construct educational facilities, medical centers, residential developments. That $400 million could sponsor initiatives directly impacting millions of Americans' existence. Meanwhile, evening broadcasts displayed casualty containers returning from Vietnam and demonstrations crowding thoroughfares. NASA discovered itself in an unwinnable situation, justifying the indefensible extravagance of lunar exploration while the nation was fragmenting at the foundations. Yet the actual destroyer wasn't solely the expense. It was the indifference. Following Apollo 11's space race victory, something terrible occurred to public engagement. The enchantment vanished. Television networks ceased transmitting live moonwalks. When Apollo 13 nearly concluded in catastrophe, the planet focused because mortality was compelling. Yet when Apollo 14 touched down successfully, indifference already experienced that. The most exceptional accomplishment in human chronicle had transformed into routine within two years' time. Consider that. We had converted walking on another celestial body, something that had been imagination for humanity's entire existence until 1969, into background information by 1971. The already experience that mindset established itself with stunning velocity. Inside NASA, the atmosphere was deteriorating. Internal communications between administration leadership and the White House conveyed increasing concern over escalating expenses and evaporating political backing. More disturbing were the scientific disputes developing within NASA itself. Certain researchers were quietly challenging whether supplementary expeditions would produce findings proportional to their astronomical cost. 
The principle of decreasing benefits was manifesting. Each fresh specimen collection from progressively distant lunar locations promised progressively smaller scientific advances. For the astronauts, this wasn't theoretical policy discussion. This was their existence. Vance Brand, Don Lind, and Harrison Schmidt were among the astronauts most regularly connected with Apollo 18 and NASA's provisional crew designations. These were individuals who had prepared for years, relinquished family time, devoted their existence to this instance. They'd mastered geology until they could recognize rock categories instantly. They'd rehearsed lunar touchdowns in simulators until the sequences were instinctive memory. They'd operated rovers across replicated moonscapes in Earth's most barren territories. Their expedition insignias were created. Their touchdown location was determined. And then, one September 1970 day, they received notification. Your expedition no longer exists. Don Lin's experience exemplifies the personal devastation. He earned recognition as the most unfortunate astronaut in NASA Chronicles. Designated for Apollo 18, he observed his moon expedition dissolve. Years of preparation, thousands of simulator hours, geological expeditions across Earth's most lunar-resembling landscapes, all for a voyage that would never initiate. He was continuously reassigned as program emphasis shifted like sand underneath his position. Precisely as Apollo 18 ultimately represented his opportunity to traverse the moon, the expedition was terminated completely. The verdict arrived rapidly and harshly. In September 1970, NASA didn't merely terminate Apollo 18. They canceled Apollo 19 and 20 simultaneously, eliminating three expeditions in one action. The declaration was presented as financial prudence, but it was political preservation. Politicians had identified a convenient target for spending reductions, and Apollo's declining returns on public excitement made it susceptible. What rendered the cancellation especially merciless? The equipment was already constructed. The spacecraft existed. The astronauts had prepared for years. Engineers at Grumman and North American Rockwell had commemorated completing the final lunar module and command module for Apollo 18, unaware their labor would never fly. Yet the authentic tragedy wasn't merely the terminated expeditions. It was the intentional dismantling of capability. NASA didn't merely postpone Apollo 18. They demolished the infrastructure. The manufacturing facilities that constructed Saturn V vehicles were terminated and dismantled. The teams that had perfected lunar operations were dissolved. The organizational knowledge, the thousand minor insights gained from each expedition, was dispersed as engineers transferred to alternative projects or departed aerospace completely. The Saturn V SA-515, the vehicle that should have transported Apollo 18 to the moon, became a museum display. This wasn't a temporary obstacle. This was NASA rendering returning to the moon impossibly expensive for successive generations. By demolishing the capability to construct Saturn V vehicles, by dissolving the teams that understood how to operate them, by allowing the supply networks and specialized installations to vanish, they guaranteed that any future lunar program would require starting from nothing. The expense projections for Apollo 18 ranged from $350 to $450 million in 1972, a figure politicians contended could sponsor educational facilities, medical centers, and social initiatives during domestic crisis. They weren't mistaken about the nation's requirements, but they were making a selection about what species we wanted to become. Don Lind wouldn't journey to space until 1985 on a shuttle expedition that couldn't compare to the lunar voyage he'd forfeited. Fifteen years of anticipation. Fifteen years of observing that Saturn V SA-515 positioned in its museum presentation like a funeral memorial to what might have existed. And so, the vehicle that should have transported humanity further into the cosmos became a memorial to what we relinquished. We commenced with the official narrative that Apollo 18 was simply a casualty of spending reductions and declining interest. A footnote in Chronicles, a terminated expedition that nobody recalls. Yet the classified documents expose the deeper reality. It was a conscious selection, an instance when America determined that political convenience mattered more than cosmic ambition. The cancellation of Apollo 18 wasn't merely about one expedition. 
It represented the facility with which humanity can forsake its finest accomplishments. We had attained the moon. We had perfected the technology. We positioned ourselves at the summit of our capability, prepared to convert lunar exploration from short visits into sustained scientific discovery. And we departed. What conspiracy advocates understood correctly? There was a concealment. Yet it wasn't regarding aliens or covert expeditions. The actual concealment was hiding in plain observation, buried in congressional testimony and spending reports that nobody desired to examine. The mundane documents that exposed how we select what matters, what we're prepared to finance, and what we're prepared to forsake when the invoice arrives. Currently, that Saturn V SA-515 resides at the Johnson Space Center, positioned horizontally in a climate-regulated structure. It's a 363-foot memorial to unrealized potential. A vehicle that could have transported us to the moon, now a museum display that reminds us what occurs when we select the immediate over the eternal. You can traverse its length, place your palm along its exterior, and sense the significance of what we relinquished. Every hardware piece is documented in the historical archive. No covert launches, no absent equipment, just meticulous documentation of what was constructed, what flew, and what concluded in museums. The astronauts supposedly lost on a classified lunar expedition. Vance Brand proceeded to fly on Apollo Soyuz and recorded three additional expeditions aboard the space shuttle. Don Lind ultimately reached space in 1985, becoming a payload specialist and researcher. Harrison Schmidt flew on Apollo 17 instead, the final human to leave impressions in lunar powder. They weren't silenced. They weren't vanished. They were reassigned. Their careers continuing in complete view of the public archive. The conspiracy wasn't a covert moon installation or hostile extraterrestrials. It was the mundane apparatus of government selecting between competing emphasis, between lunar exploration and social initiatives, between tomorrow's aspirations and today's emergency. This narrative matters currently more than previously. Apollo 18's cancellation remains a case examination in balancing ambition with sustainability, directly influencing NASA's cautious methodology to Artemis and contemporary lunar programs. Current expedition planners emphasize international cooperation, commercial partnerships, and modular exploration frameworks. Insights gained from observing Apollo's summit capability relinquished on the altar of short-term reasoning. The inquiry confronting us isn't whether aliens are authentic. It's whether we'll make the identical selections our predecessors made in 1970. Whether we'll once more exchange the stars for immediate political convenience. Because the actual secret of Apollo 18 wasn't concealed in classified documents or buried on the lunar terrain. It was written in spending memoranda and political addresses. The mundane documents that eliminated humanity's finest adventure. We didn't forsake the moon because of what we discovered there. We forsook it because we ceased looking upward. Apollo 18 never flew. Yet its phantom haunts every determination we make about space exploration currently. Because the actual inquiry wasn't whether we could continue proceeding to the moon. It's whether we possess the courage to complete what we initiated or if we'll continue constructing vehicles that never depart the surface. The selection, as always, is ours. If you appreciated this narrative, press subscribe for additional narratives where chronicles, technology, and human ambition intersect. Thanks for watching.